Okay, folks, so this is the Garmin Venue, Garmin's fitness-focused smartwatch that utilizes an OLED display rather than the transflective display that they've used for years and years. And in fact, the Venue is basically just an OLED version of the Vivoctor 4, which I have right here. The nice thing about transflective displays is that they have really good readability and direct sunlight, but maybe more importantly, they don't consume a lot of power. OLED displays, on the other hand, they're going to be a little bit prettier to look at than a transflective display, but they may not have the battery life that some people may desire. And Garmin's known for pretty decent battery life on their devices, so it was kind of a big departure for them to go down this route. So in today's video, we're going to find out how that battery life actually fares. But just like all my videos, the bulk of this review is going to be how this device works in a fitness capacity. And you probably already saw how long this video is. It's not short by any means, but I'd really encourage you to watch the entire thing. I like to test these types of devices quite thoroughly, using it for lots of different types of activities like running, cycling, weight training, swimming, and I even took it skiing, just so you can get a better idea if this device is gonna be right for you. So if this video does help you out at all, don't be shy about hitting that like button down below as it definitely helps the channel a lot, and I appreciate it. So the OLED display on the Venue is unsurprisingly quite nice to look at. They utilize the brighter and crisper display with stuff like live watch faces, which have animations when they are enabled. And then you also may notice some nicer looking activity summary screens when you complete your workout. Now, they definitely could utilize that brighter and crisper display with more animations and more areas of the interface, but on the other hand, that could consume a little bit more battery life. And in regards to battery life, I was pleasantly surprised that I was able to get about three to five days out of it, depending on how many outdoor activities I use with GPS, as well as a couple other settings. The first was having the always on display enabled or disabled. If you have it enabled, bank on closer to three days. And if you want longer battery life, just go ahead and disable the always on display and then you can just wake the screen up by using the wrist gesture or just tapping on the screen or one of the buttons. And then another setting that can make a difference is whether or not you have Pulse OX enabled. This setting can make a pretty big impact and I personally had it turned off for all day tracking but on for sleep tracking. Which I suppose is a good segue into sleep tracking which I found it to be fairly accurate. On this particular night, it was pretty much on the money. It was accurate for when I went to bed as well as when I finally got up, and it was also accurate at this point here where I woke up briefly. And it was also accurate in the fact that I did not get much deep sleep that night. If you do have the Pulse OX setting enabled for sleep tracking, it will also provide this information, and then you can also view your respiration rate throughout the night. Before we get into the sports and fitness side of things, I do want to go over some of the smartwatch features really quick. So you can reply to text messages using predefined responses that you'll set up in Garmin Connect Mobile, but this is only going to be available on Android. Apple has a pretty tight lockdown on iMessage, which is why you don't see iMessage functionality on anything but basically an Apple Watch. The venue also has contactless payments using Garmin Pay, and then it also does have offline music storage and playback using music streaming services like Spotify, Deezer, as well as Amazon Music, which allows you to have music stored on the device so you can listen to music while you're doing an activity without you having to carry your phone. So it's quite capable in that department. And I have a few videos that I'll link down in the description below of how those exactly work. So with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and get into the sports side of things with the venue. The venue has quite a few sport profiles to choose from, from running both outdoors and indoors, cycling both outdoors and indoors as well, walking and floor climbing, pool swimming, but no open water swimming. It also sports a golf profile, and then you're going to have some winter sport profiles. Skiing and snowboarding here utilize the barometric altimeter that's built in, and I'll have a short demonstration of skiing here in just a bit. But then there's also cross-country skiing, stand-up paddleboarding, and then there's some gym-based activities like strength training, a generic cardio profile, as well as elliptical and rowing. And then finally, you'll also have yoga, pilates, and breath work. With some of these activity profiles, Garmin has some guided workouts with some animations that'll kind of just guide you through the workout. And these include strength training, yoga, Pilates, and breath work. I have another video where I go into a lot more detail about the guided workout animations using the VWAC 4, and I'll have that video linked up here as well as the description below. But now onto the more common workouts, and let's go ahead and first start with running. On this run here, we see the distance line up pretty well with two other reference devices, one of which is the much more expensive Phoenix 6, but still uses the same GPS chipset as the Venue. There was, however, a bit of variance in elevation, although there wasn't really much in terms of elevation gain. And there's more elevation gain with mountain biking and road biking, which we'll see in just a second. And now on to heart rate. So in all the following examples, I used an external chest heart rate strap as my main reference device. And then on some examples, I also used an external arm heart rate strap as both of those are generally accurate sources of heart rate data. And I'll be using the DC Rainmaker Analyzer tool to compare all my data. And you'll see the venue data highlighted in red and then the reference devices in green and blue. 
So on this run here, we see that things line up pretty well for the most part. There were a few little hiccups here or there, but overall, there's not too much to complain about. However, I did have one run where I encountered a bit of weirdness when I was doing intervals at the end. It started behaving a bit better right at the end, but I did encounter a bit of wonkiness there. So heart rate for running was for the most part okay, but I also did want to go over how the venue performed in terms of estimating indoor running distances on a treadmill. So it's best to go on a handful of runs outside first, just so the venue can actually learn your running dynamics like cadence and stride length, just so it can get a better estimation of indoor running distance. And I was actually kind of astonished how close the venue was to the distance being recorded in the treadmill. Now, treadmills can be slightly off sometimes, but these numbers did line up pretty darn well. And what is nice is that if for some reason the distance is off, you do have the option to calibrate the venue by entering the actual distance before you save your run. Okay, so now onto cycling. So with road biking, again, we see the distances line up really well. If we take a closer peek at the GPS tracks, all the reference devices are perfectly in line. There's nothing to complain about here. The elevation was probably a bit lower than what I would have liked to see, but was within the same ballpark, I suppose. It could be a little bit better though. For heart rate, this first example was a rather flat road ride, and we see that the results, although not perfect, aren't terrible either. Overall, the heart rate followed along fairly well, but you'll notice on some occasions where it veered off a bit, but recovered. In the middle, we see a little spike for about a minute, and then at the end, there were a few points that it read a little bit low. Now, that was a pretty flat road ride, but here's another road ride that had a lot more hills, and what we can see is that the heart rate sensor had a harder time keeping up. In all fairness, there were some very steep hills where I was standing quite a bit, and at these points, my wrist had a lot more flexion, which can throw off most wrist-based heart rate sensors. For mountain biking, again, the venue did really well in regards to distance against two other devices. Now, although the elevation is just slightly lower than the other two, this is still pretty good considering just how much gain and loss this particular ride had. These were extremely steep climbs and descents, and I'd have to say that this is all very respectable. But heart rate was just like pretty much any other wrist-based heart rate sensor that I've tested for mountain biking, and basically it's not exactly usable. But like I said, that's basically the same experience I've had with pretty much any other wrist-based heart rate sensor for mountain biking, since there's so much gripping and movement that can happen over rocky terrain, but we're gonna see a lot better results with indoor cycling. On this ride here, it performed really well throughout, except for a bit of a drop right here where I increased heart rate, but for the rest of the session, it did pretty well. On this next example, again, pretty good for the most part, except for a couple hiccups here or there. The venue also comes with Garmin Strength Training Activity Profile, which is designed to automatically count reps, and then also attempts to identify the particular type of exercise that you're doing. Basically, it's pretty good at counting reps, but it's gonna be pretty hit and miss in terms of identifying the exercise. And I actually did a pretty in-depth video on the Strength Training Activity Profile, and I'll have that linked up here as well as the description below. So just like mountain biking, weight training and high intensity interval training can be activities that can be really challenging for wrist-based heart rate sensors just because there's a lot of gripping and a lot of arm movement that can occur. And even external arm heart rate straps can have some challenges here, which you'll see some of that in the following examples. What you'll see in this first example is the venue reads pretty high for the first third of the session and then settles down around the middle section when there are gonna be some longer rest periods. Then as soon as the sets increase in frequency, it starts to have more trouble. On this next example, again, we see that the venue reads a bit high at the beginning, but actually does an okay job for a bit. For the most part, what you'll see is that the venue reads a bit higher than other sources throughout, but at the end, it didn't track the decrease in heart rate. And then I have one final example for you, just to show you that those other examples weren't just flukes. Again, we see a higher heart rate than actual at the beginning, and then it reads a bit high for almost all of the session, especially at the end. So what you can see is that when you're comparing the heart rate data from the venue compared to a trusted source of heart rate, like a chest heart rate monitor, there's definitely gonna be some variance there. Okay, so now onto swimming. So with swimming, the venue does come with a pool swimming profile, but doesn't have an open water swimming profile. So with a pool swim profile, you can customize the data screens to show up to four data fields. You can also choose your pool length with some predetermined pool lengths, but you can also enter in a custom pool length in meters or yards. You can set up different alerts, but you can also enable the setting called auto rest, which I'll talk about here in just one second. Since the venue does have a two button configuration with every lap, you can press the lower right hand button to trigger a lap if you wanna do that manually. 
but you actually don't have to manually trigger those laps. So the venue along with many other Garmin wearables will automatically detect laps and your total distance. And then going back to that auto rest feature, if you enable this, it'll automatically detect when you stop your interval and then start a rest timer. So your rest time isn't included with your interval time. And I found this to work extremely well. This was within seconds of me stopping to rest after an interval, and it was really good at recognizing when I actually stopped and automatically starting the rest timer. And then it will also automatically scroll to show you the time from your last interval during this rest time. So the auto rest feature works really well, but in regards to all the other data that the venue can collect, it'll show you all the normal stuff like total time, distance, pace, as well as your swell score. You can also see more details like your best pace and stroke metrics. And then from here, you can also see a breakdown of each interval, but there's even more information that you can see. If we hop on over to Garmin Connect on our desktop web browser, you can see a breakdown of tons of information that the venue can collect, including a breakdown of your intervals, the rest time in between your intervals, stroke type, since it does also automatically detect stroke type, and even heart rate per intervals. You can also see this information in Garmin Connect Mobile if you rotate your device on the interval screen. Now, the venue does have the ability to collect wrist-based heart rate in the water, but this can be a little bit challenging because there's going to be a lot of arm movement, plus there's also the possibility of water going in between the sensor and your skin. And although the venue was not perfect by any means compared to a chest heart rate strap, I have to say that it's not terrible. It followed along the trends fairly well over most of this swim. The portion in the middle here is where we saw a few issues come up where it tracked a bit high, but still, I'd say that it's okay-ish with no huge drops or spikes. And then I also took the venue skiing, so both downhill skiing as well as cross-country skiing. So with the downhill skiing as well as snowboarding profile, it actually utilizes the onboard barometric altimeter to determine when you're riding up on the chairlift versus when you're actually going down the run. As you're ascending on the lift, you can view the data from your last run, including the time, distance, elevation loss, as well as maximum and average speed. And then there's also another data page where you can see the total runs that you've done along with the cumulative data. And then when you're done with your day, you can see all that data in Garmin Connect where you can get all that detail broken down by runs where you would normally see laps. And finally, I also took the venue cross-country skiing. There's actually going to be a nice little map when you're done skiing, and then there's also going to be that familiar heart rate graph. Distance was very close to the Phoenix 6 that I used that day, but funny enough, the 400 945 came up about a tenth of a mile short that day, and it's kind of a weird. And what we can see is that the 945 cut some corners in a few places on these loops. Kind of strange as I generally get pretty consistent results from the 945, but one of these loops was in a pretty dense tree covered area, but the good news is the venue did pretty well. And although the venue did well with the GPS with this activity, the heart rate was uh, not so great. And again, we're talking about another activity that does involve a lot of wrist flexion and movement. So if you're doing this sort of activity along with weight training or mountain biking, just go ahead and get an external chest heart rate strap for the most accurate data. Okay, so with all that, what's the verdict on the venue? Well, I think Garmin did a nice job implementing an OLED display while still maintaining pretty decent battery life. If you've been looking for a fitness focused smartwatch, which has a nice display, but you weren't so keen on the battery life that you get on like an Apple Watch Series 4 or 5, or even a Samsung Galaxy Watch Active, this could be a pretty good option. The venue is going to be great for endurance based sports like running, cycling, and swimming, but may have more challenges in areas like weight training and high intensity interval training. But again, that's not necessarily the heart rate sensor's fault, it's more just the nature of that particular type of exercise. That said, the venue is still a very capable device having all of those sport profiles that you can choose from, including skiing and snowboarding, and then there's even golf. When the venue first launched, the price was a little bit challenging, but it's since dropped to a price which I think is going to be a lot more reasonable. And I have a link in the description below where you can check out the most current pricing. Anyways, if this video did help you out at all, don't be shy about hitting that like button down below and also subscribing to the channel for plenty of sports tech reviews coming soon. Thanks for watching.